hearing loss, conductive loss. Uh, we're going to start with that. Remember, a conductive loss is a disorder in the auditory canal. So that's our ear canal over there. Let me pick my laser pointer. So this is our uh, ear canal. So it's any disorder in the auditory canal, the eardrum, or the ossicles, which are our incus, malleus, and steps. Conductive hearing loss, of course, when there's a problem, transferring sound waves anywhere along the pathway through the outer ear, the tympanic membrane, or the middle ear, which are our ossicles. And some causes of this conductive hearing loss could be as a result of infections of the ear, any inflammation, uh, foreign bodies, trauma, even accumulation of ear wax can also cause a conductive hearing loss. And when you assess your patient, I'm sure you would have noticed we keep making reference to assessment, assessment, assessment. You want to remember that's the first step of your nursing process. And that's also the first step of every attempt on the NCLEX questions. And again, the NCLEX would always present their patients with these, will I call it signs and symptoms, but they will not refer it to as signs and symptoms. But what you will hear is the nurse assess the patient and notice this, or the patient came in complaining of this. So on the assessment, the patient is going to have pain. It's going to complain of pain. It's going to be feverish. He would complain of headaches. There could also be ear discharge. Um, you would also notice some personality changes like irritability. It could be depressed. It could be withdrawn. So those are some of the uh, assessment findings you will get on this patient. And one major complication you need to take note of is that an infection here could travel down and, and get uh, the meninges, the coverings of the brain infected, and that could lead to meningitis. So always remember when your patient, uh, you have a, 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 an endless question and they're making reference to an initial infection of the ear, you want to start thinking about a possible meningitis infection or complication as a result of that infection. Again, in terms of diagnosis, we could confirm this disorder by using an audiogram, which would assess the degree of loss. It's actually a graph. It comes in a graph sheet and shows the threshold for certain frequencies. So the audiometer will be uh, pinging at different frequencies, and then the patient needs to identify what frequencies he's hearing. At a lower frequency, he will press a knob to say, yes, I can still hear that. You take it to a higher frequency. If he can hear it, once he stops hearing it, he presses the knob, and he's going to plot a graph. So that's going to be your audiogram. That's what you can use to assess conductive loss in your patient. Again, we could also use a turning fork, which looks at the type or the quality of hearing loss. So the turning fork uh, is struck and it's used to assess vibratory sensations and hearing. You're looking out for air conduction and bone conduction. So that's why your turning fork will help you to assess in this patient. In terms of your plan for this patient, you want to apply heat. Again, you're going to place this patient on antibiotics because you have, a, you have a, an infection there. If there's hearing loss, he might need to go on hearing aid to help him hear better. And then, for example, remember we talked about wax that could build up and cause this uh, hearing loss. You might need to remove this impacted wax and we'll need to carry out ear irrigation. Again, you, this is contraindicated if there's evidence of swelling or tenderness in the ear. So you don't want to carry out this procedure if there's swelling or tenderness. And how do you carry out this procedure? You want the patient tilting his head toward the affected side. So this is the side you want to irrigate. So you want the patient tilting his head towards the side. And again, you want to use your syringe and direct a stream of fluid against the sides of the ear canal. You are not pushing it against the eardrum, against the sides of the ear canal. 
And that's what you're going to use to try to dislodge the wax or whatever is occluding the airway. Again, after this procedure, you want to instruct the client to lie on the affected side because you want all of the fluid you pushed into the ears draining out. So you want him to affect, uh, lie on the affected side to allow all those fluid drain out. Another uh, assistance we can do or carry out, another procedure we can carry out for this patient would be administration of eardrops. This is a, a recurrent NCLEX question where they want to know if you know the procedure for um, instilling eardrops. So you can see we have an adult and a child. For the adult, one way to remember this is the U in the adult tells you up, while the D in the child tells you down. And what is the up or down we are talking about? Man, first, you have to position the affected ear uppermost. So let's assume is this ear we are dealing with. So that ear has to be uppermost. And then you want to pull the outer ear upwards. That's why we have this up here and backwards. And this is for children, uh, for adults and older children of age and above, three years of age and above. So up, you pull back and up for adults. Remember the U here, that gives you uh, the direction for adults. Whereas for the children below three years of, old, of age, you want to pull the outer ear downwards. That's why we have this down and backwards. And again, you want to place the drop so that they run down the wall of the ear canal. And after the procedure, you want to have the client lie on the unaffected ear to encourage absorption. Remember, with the irrigation, we want the, the client lying on the affected ear so that we can have good drainage. But with your eardrop installation, you want to have the client lying on the affected and the unaffected side to encourage absorption. Again, we might need to carry out surgery for this client. What are your preoperative responsibilities or care towards this client? Before we take him for surgery, how far damaged is this ear? What is the baseline? We carry out an audiometry to know how far along this patient's ear damage is so that we know what we are measuring it against after the surgery. Again, you want to assess the symptoms he has or he came in with before the surgery. Again, you want to encourage the client to wash hair prior to surgery because if there's any surgical dressing and all of that, he won't be able to wash his hair because you don't want the dressing soaked. And as part of your teaching, you want to teach the client to expect some post-operative hearing loss. That's also another recurrent endless question. Remember, tell your client at the, at the end of the surgery, you might have some post-operative hearing loss. It is normal. And again, you want to discuss the need for special position of operative ear, depending on the uh, physician's order. So these are some of your pre-operative teaching. At the end of the procedure or the surgery, you want to reinforce the dressing. You don't want to change it. Remember, like we said, it's always the surgeon who does the first uh, dressing change. So always note that. That's also another good and clear question. Again, because of the, the, the location of the surgery, you don't want your client blowing his nose. He needs to avoid blowing his nose, avoid sneezing, avoid coughing. Anything that would kind of trigger the vasal valve maneuver, you want to avoid that. After the surgery, observe for possible complications. What possible complications may arise from this surgery? If you look at the, where the ear is, you will know that the facial nerve runs around that area of the ear. So it could actually be tampered with during the surgery. So you want to note for facial nerve damage. Remember that's our seventh cranial nerve, the one that runs along the, the ear area. So that's your seventh cranial nerve. And again, you need to teach your client that it may be transient. What he's experiencing may be transient. It would still fade away. Again, another complication you should be worried about is infection. In all your surgeries, you want to keep a very a keen eye for any sign of infection. Again, another complication could be vertigo or vertigo or tinnitus. Remember, vertigo is that sensation that you feel, you think you or the environment around you is moving or spinning. That's vertigo. So that's one complication. Tinnitus would be the ringing, 
the patient may be having his ears. So you want to observe for these complications. And again, you want to administer uh, medications that are prescribed post-surgery, provide for the client's safety. And again, you want to position the client on the unaffected side. This would help to decrease swelling and pain of surgical sites. As part of your discharge teaching, apart, uh, your discharge teaching would include avoid getting water into the ear, avoid flying because of that pressure that builds up in the tube or in the plane. You want your client to avoid flying, avoid crowds. Avoid crowds because the client is vulnerable to infection. So you want to avoid putting him in a position where he could get infected. And again, you also want to avoid people with respiratory infection. So we talked about conductive hearing loss. Let's look at perceptive or sensor renewal loss. So perceptive, perceptive deafness or sensorineural hearing loss is caused by malformations or damage to the inner ear or the auditory nerve. So that's our auditory nerve there. So any damage that happens to the inner ear, any damage to the inner ear or the auditory nerve. So you can see where our inner ear starts from. So if there's any damage to the eustachian tube, to the cochlear, to the semi-circular canals, uh, to the vestibular nerve, the facial nerve, auditory nerve, that would be your sensorineural hearing loss. And it's primarily due to this organ, uh, disorder of the organ of corti or the auditory nerve. Major causes of this could be, it could be congenital, for example, if the mother is exposed to communicable diseases, it could cause this disorder. Again, infection is one primary cause. Some drugs are toxic to the ear, so they could also cause this hearing loss. Trauma, trauma to the ear or to the inner ear can also cause this problem. Uh, we could also have labyrinth disorder. For example, your Meniere's disease, Remember, Meniere's disease is a disorder of the inner ear that can lead to vertigo and hearing loss. So anyone that has Meniere's disease could actually suffer a perceptive or sensory neural loss. So what do you see in your patients with this kind of disorder? There's going to be pain. There's going to be fever. There's going to be headaches. You will complain of ear discharge. And again, we could see those personality changes we talked about, like your irritability, the depression, uh, withdrawal, suspiciousness. So you will notice those personality changes. And your major complications would be vertigo. Remember we said, remember this is the organ that, uh, this is our organ that manages your sense of stability, that keeps you stable. So once there's any, uh, affectation to this, it could result to complications like vertigo, where you have everywhere spinning around you, or the hearing uh, ringing in your ears, or the patient can actually have nausea and vomiting. Let's look at care of the deaf or someone who is hard of hearing. How do you assist this patient? What do you need to know about this topic as regards the NCLEX? Communication is key. You need to enhance communication for this patient who is hard of hearing or who does not hear you as properly as he should. And how do you enhance proper, uh, communication? If you are talking to this person, you want to sit directly in front of the patient. You want to sit in a room that is well lit. At least the person needs to see your mouth movement because some of them read your lips. Uh, incidentally, we have the corona with us and most people having to put on their face masks, those that are hard of hearing are having a very hard time hearing people because usually they, are, they read lips, but now with the masks, they can't read your lips. Again, you want to be in a quiet room. 
because the person is already having difficulty hearing you. Being in a quiet room would actually help to hear uh, better than he would if it's in a, in a noisy environment. Again, before you start talking to this client, you want to get his attention. If possible, move close to the better ear. If it's one ear that's affected, then talk to the one that's not, talk to the ear that's not affected. Again, you want to speak clearly and slowly. Don't shout, you don't need to shout. Again, keep your hands and other objects away from your mouth when speaking. Like I said, they want to read your lips. Have the client repeat statements because that way you are sure he heard you. So you are not saying obese, a boy, and he's thinking he had obese, a gun or something like that. So you don't want to cover your mouth when you speak. Use appropriate hand motions, gesticulation, so that way he understands, uh, he adds that gesticulations to what you are saying and is able to make meaning of it. Again, write messages down if the client is able to read. In terms of teaching, provide this client with healthcare resources. Encourage use of visual cues. What are your visual cues? Like objects, pictures, or even written words, because this will help to provide the individual with information. For example, how to do a routine. So you can write down how to on the washing machine. So that way he can use that as a visual cue when he wants to turn on the machine instead of you having to tell him and he doesn't really hear you or grabs you properly. Again, you want to advise that auditory cues also like your smoke alarm may not work for these clients. If there's a smoke, he won't hear the alarm when it rings because he's also hard of hearing. So you want to bring that in. And you could also resort to surgery to try to resolve whatever is causing the hearing loss. Acute otitis media is an infection of the middle ear. It's actually a painful type of ear infection and occurs when the area behind the eardrum or the area behind the eardrum, which is our middle ear, becomes inflamed and infected. It could be caused by bacteria or viruses. So you can see what a normal ear should look like and here you can see this bulging tympanic membrane and increased blood flow, hyperemia. So this is our acute otitis media. So what do you see in a patient with this condition? In children, you will see fits of fuzziness and intense crying, especially in infants. There's intense crying because of the pain. So normally there will be fever because it's an infection, there will be chills, there will be headaches, there will be ringing in the ear or tinnitus. It could lead to deafness. Uh, there could be that sharp pain. And again, in children, you will see them pulling their ears, egg, uh, ear tugging or crying or head rolling because they can't really say what is hurting them. So these are signs you look out for in children that could tell you they could be having this condition, otitis, acute otitis media. Again, there could be nausea and vomiting and then this red bulging tympanic membrane. One of the major or some of the common complications would be the acute, acute meaning something that just propped up to it remaining there. So now it has become chronic. So it can progress from acute otitis media to chronic otitis media in that client. And again, children remember are more susceptible to come down with this chronic otitis media because of that short uh, eustachian tube that they have. So the ear infection is readily uh, travels from maybe a throat infection to the ear or vice versa. So they are more susceptible. Again, another complication would be this could lead to residual deafness. Even after the infection has cleared, the deafness still remains. It could also lead to perforation of the tympanic membrane. You can see it's already bulging and could perforate. So that would be another complication. Again, there could be cholesteatoma growth. What is this cholestatoma growth? It's an abnormal, non-cancerous skin growth that can develop in the middle section of the ear behind the eardrum. It may be a birth defect, but it's most commonly caused by repeated middle ear infection. So you could see this that will develop as a result of continuous or recurrent ear infections. So we say it's a cholestatoma growth. Again, we could also have mastoiditis, which is a serious infection in the mastoid process. Remember, the mastoid process is that hard, prominent bone 
just behind or under the ear. So if you feel behind your ear, you could feel your mastoid bone. So an infection can go from the middle ear and uh, spread into the mastoid bone to cause mastoiditis. Or it can also result to meningitis, which, are, which is an inflammation of the meninges, which are the brain coverings or the membranes that cover the brain and the spinal cord. So this would occur when fluid surrounding the meninges become infected. So what's our plan? We want to administer medications for this client with acute otitis media. Uh, again, the antibiotic we use must be organism specific. We could also give antihistamines for allergies. We could also give nasal decongestants to clear the airway and all of that. Again, we can insert ventilatory tubes. So these are tubes that could be used to relieve the pressure behind the middle ear. So they are inserted in the eustachian tube for continuous ventilation of the canal. Again, we can insert a myringotomy or we can carry out a myringotomy or put in a myringotomy tube. So a myringotomy would be a tympanic membrane incision to relieve pressure. And again, there could be purulent fluid that is backing up behind the eardrum. So you want to make this incision and allow all of this to drain out of the middle ear. Again, if you have this opening or if you've carried out this myrogotomy, you want to avoid water from going into the ear for any reason. No swimming, no washing of the ear and the face and the head, at least for this period, the myrogotomy is in place. Again, we can carry out a tympanoplasty which would be a surgical reconstruction of the ossicles and the tympanic membrane, maybe as a result of the acute otitis infection. Uh, bed rest is also important, especially if the client is feverish, you want to help him conserve energy. And again, you want to position on side of involved ear. Why is that? Because we want to have all of the purulent fluid and fluid backing up behind there. We want all of them draining out. So again, remember, this is your myringotomy. So otomy, like it sounds, means cutting into. Plasty here means like uh, repairing or building or something. You are creating something. So you want to use this to understand when you see it in your NCLEX, you want, even though you don't know what myringo is, but knowing that otomy means cutting into or plasty means repairing. That will give you an idea of whatever the procedure is. So you want to know your suffix. So let's look at Meniere's disease. We already talked about Meniere's disease. It's also called endolymphatic high drops. How do you know a patient has Meniere's disease? There's going to be this dizziness or vertigo. Remember we said vertigo is that feeling of turning around and all, feeling every, your environment is turning or you, you are turning around. Again, the client would have hearing loss. Uh, there's ringing in the ear. There's this feeling of fullness in the ear. So those are what you see in Meniere's disease. Dizziness, vertigo, hearing loss, ringing in the ear, and a feeling of fullness. Again, you would also see dilatation of the membrane of the labyrinth. So these are our labyrinth, and you can see is distended. So another feature you see is that there's this recurrent attack of vertigo with sensorineural hearing loss. So that's one major characteristics. The vertigo goes, it comes back, it goes, it comes back, it keeps recurring. And these attacks recur several times a week. Even you can have a period of remission or a period where nothing happens for several years, and all of a sudden it's back again. And one major complication from Meniere's disease would be your patient losing his ability to hear. So that's one major complication. So in a part of our assessment, we're going to see nausea and vomiting. We're going to see this incapacitating vertigo. The guy cannot cope with it. It's just too much. It's, over it's overwhelming. You're going to see ringing in the ear. We already said you will see the fullness in the ear. And there's decreased hearing on the involved side. Again, you would also notice this gamus and headaches. How do you diagnose uh, Meniere's disease? We can carry out the Weber test 
or the grind test. With the Weber test, we are still, both of them involve using your turning fork. So these are turning fork, these are turning fork. So we're going to strike a turning fork for the Weber test and place it on the middle of the patient's forehead. Again, the patient will note where the sound is heard best. Am I hearing it better in the left ear or the right ear or both? I hear them, I hear it well on both ears equally. So that's one way to detect uh, if there's any hearing loss. Again, if he's hearing it better on one side, or on the opposite ear, that tells you is a sensorineural loss. For the right test, you are still going to strike a turning fork, but this time around, you are going to place it on the mastoid bone behind the ear. When the client can no longer hear the sound, he needs to signal to the doctor or the nurse who is carrying out the test and say, I can't hear the sound again. Then the doctor or the nurse would move the turning fork next to the ear canal, and then strike it again. When you can no longer hear the sound, you again signal and say, I can no longer hear it. And the doctor or the nurse is going to record the length of time you hear each sound. And that way, they're able to diagnose if you have this uh, hearing disorder. One major way to manage this client would be modifying his diet, dietary modification. Because initially treatment is focused on diet in clients with Meniere's disease. Uh, you want to reduce sodium intake because it would help in reducing the water content of the inner ear. So like we said, you can see all of this bulging from fluid building up in the uh, labyrinth. So by reducing sodium intake, managing his diet, low sodium diet, you can help to reduce that feud that is building up in the endolipid, uh, endolymphatic sac. Um, you also want to avoid caffeine, nicotine, alcohol. We again, we're going to manage him on some drugs like your antihistamines in the acute phase. We can give epinephrine, diphenhydramine. So those are our antibiotics. Again, we can give our antiemetics like your prochloroperazine. That will help to relieve the nausea and the vomiting. We can give antivertigo medications like your meclizine or your diazepam. We can also give diuretics because we said we have fluid building up like your hydrochlorothiazide or your triamterine. So this would help this patient very well. Again, in the acute phase, you want to place the client on bed rest. Provide protection when he wants to move around. Let me say he wants to go to the toilet. You need to walk with him. You need to give him support because of client safety. Remember, the NCLEX is testing your ability to keep your patient safe. So you need to be conscious that this client's uh, disorder can affect him when he decides to walk. So you need to put in measures to protect the client. We already talked about the low sodium diet, avoiding caffeine, nicotine, and alcohol. Again, we can decompress the endo, endolymphatic sac using a Teflon shunt. So you can see this the sac is filled with fluid, and we can use this shunt to drain this fluid out of the endolymphatic sac. Remember, this is a surgical procedure to help to drain the sac. Again, we can carry out total labyrinthectomy. Again, this would be as a last resort if it's leading to or uh, if it's a complication of Bell's palsy. We will look at Bell's palsy in the subsequent slides. So as part of your client education, you need to tell this client that he needs to slow down body movement, no jerking or sudden movement, because any of these can precipitate those vertigos he, he, that keeps recurring. So no jerky or sudden movements. Again, he needs to lie down when an attack occurs because of that dizziness, and that feeling of vertigo, he needs to lie down whenever an attack occurs. And if driving, he needs to pull over and stop the car because at that moment he's incapacitated, he cannot safely drive a car. And again, you need to carry out occupational counseling because depending on where he walks, if he walks with heavy machineries and he gets vertigo, you can imagine him, maybe his hands falling into the 
grinding machine or the turning machine and all of that. So we need to cancel these clients. So let's look at cranial nerves. So we know our cranial nerves. And one way to remember your cranial nerves is by drawing a face. So for me, I like uh, drawing a face uh, with my cranial nerve. We are not good artists, but um, uh, you can at least sketch a face. So me, I'm going to start with the eyes, my two eyes. And then I'm going to draw a nose. And I'm going to give him a mouth, kind of a smiling mouth. Uh, let me draw the sides of the face. So I'm drawing the sides of the face. Uh, let me draw his shoulders. So let me draw it. So this is his shoulders. Although my shoulders are looking uh, like his hands. So let me clean this up. If you have a pen, you can draw this along with me. So this would be his shoulders. And my shoulders are looking upward, but just believe me when I say it's his shoulders, these are his shoulders. So let me draw his ear here. So this is ear. Um, and this is his ear. Remember in the NCLEX, you will have a white board that you can actually do this. Remember your goal in the NCLEX is not to solve the 600 or 1 million questions they are going to ask you. Your goal is to get as much as you can correctly. We don't want to go past that 75 uh, limit. So you need to take your time, don't rush. I need to answer as much as possible so that before you know it, they will check I got 40 over 60. No, we want to get as much correct as possible and stay above the passing line. So trust me when I say you have time to do this on the whiteboard when you are taking your NCLEX. Okay, so I've drawn my ear. Uh, I didn't give him a, an eyebrow. So let me give him an eyebrow. So this is eyebrow. So don't forget to, we are doing cranial nerve. Uh, there's this uh, sternal notch. If you put your hand in between, just directly under your throat, you will feel this sternal notch there, like a hole there. So I'm just going to say this is sternal notch. Um, so this is sternal notch there. Um, some people have nice eyes. So I'm just going to give him an eye, like a two, if you want to call it a two. Um, how about uh, ladies like putting on all these eyelashes? So I'll just put some eyelashes for him here. Okay, maybe I can just stop here and, and explain what I'm doing. If you look at this, you will see that I'm actually using numbers to draw this face, even though the guy looks very ugly. But again, these are what they represent. Like when I said number one, I'm using one to draw the nose. One is actually the olfactory, olfactory nerve. So uh, cranial nerve one is our olfactory nerve that deals with transmitting information to the brain regarding a person's sense of smell. So you can always remember to draw your nose with number one, and that tells you number one is your olfactory nerve. Number two, you can see where it is, it's inside the eyes. So that tells me it has to do with the eyes. Remember, you could refer to the eyes as optic, that's why we say optician, or you can refer to oculo, which is also eye or eye muscles and all of that. So oculo is still related to the eyes. So number two is in my eyes. So that tells me number two is my what? Optic nerve. Remember, the optic nerve transmits information to the brain regarding what? Vision. So I need, I don't need to, if, well, you can cram it if you can, but I know that cranial nerve two is my optic nerve. Now look at uh, number three, which are his eyelashes, even though they are lying down, but it's actually three. And it's also related to the eye. And again, I know that I can move my eyes. Uh, the muscles around the eyes, what helps me to move my eyes around. So this tells me cranial nerve three is my oculomotor nerve. Oculomotor nerve, that's my cranial nerve three. It helps to control eye movements. 
How about number four? You can see where I put number four here for my eye uh, mascara. I don't know what they call it that ladies apply, but you can see where they are here. So these are my trochlear nerves. I know that number four is my trochlear nerve, and that's a nerve that powers the muscles that allows the eye to point downwards. So that's why I have them underneath here so that I can remember it's down. You can look, the eye can look downwards. And those are our trochlear nerves. How about number five? Number five would have messed up the picture. That's why I didn't put it. But number five actually runs around the entire face. So that's why I didn't really put it. But that's where your number five would be. Remember, it's the largest cranial nerve. That's why it's taking all of this space. So number five is our uh, trigeminal nerve. Cranial nerve five is our trigeminal nerve. It's the largest cranial nerve, and it has both motor and sensory function. Again, whenever you hear your trigeminal nerve, we remember it's number five, is the largest cranial nerve. And again, we remember trigeminal neuralgia. Neuralgia means pain. Trigeminal, referring to the trigeminal nerve, which is our cranial nerve number five. Uh, okay, we missed out on number six. Number six is actually located to the sides of both eyes. So number six are located to the sides of both eyes. And they are the ones that help control eye movements also, especially towards the side. So these are our, our these are our abducens nerve. A, B, D, U, C, E, N, S, your abducens nerve. So that's cranial nerve number six. And all of them around the eyes, you know, relates to the eyes and the eye muscles. Again, look at our number seven. That's what we use to draw the sides of the face. So you can see our cranial nerve seven. That's what we use to dry, uh, draw the uh, sides of the face. Remember when we talked about our complications from ear surgery, you can see where the ears are and that's where your cranial, your facial nerves are running. So that's why we said a complication could be facial uh, nerve injury because if the surgery is around the ear, it can also impact the facial nerve. So number seven is our facial nerve. And whenever you hear about Bell's palsy, Bell's palsy, your mind should go to number, cranial nerve number seven. We'll look at Bell's palsy in subsequent slides. Again, remember the facial nerve helps with movement of muscles that provide facial expression. Uh, movement of the lacrimal, submaxillary, submandibular glands. Again, the sensation of the outer ear, of the external ear, is part of what the cranial nerve seven does. And also this partly sensation of test comes from the uh, facial nerve. Now look at eight. Eight is what we use for ear. So that tells is related to the ears. It's our cochlear nerve or our vestibulocochlear nerve. So whenever you hear about cranial nerve eight, remember we used eight to draw this diagram. That tells you it's your cochlear nerve or your vestibular cochlear nerve. So whenever anything affects the cochlear nerve, uh, the person could have hearing loss and all of that. Again, whenever you hear of disorder to your eighth cranial nerve, you should ring a bell to acoustic neuroma. Acoustic neuroma is when you have a mass pressing on the acoustic nerve or your cochlear nerve. So neuroma means growth. Acoustic relates to hearing. So if you have a mass pressing, but again, we'll still look at it in subsequent slide. But always remember, when you hear facial nerve, you are thinking Bell's palsy. When you hear vestibular cochlear nerve, you are thinking acoustic neuroma. When you hear cranial nerve five, which is your trigeminal nerve, you are listening or you're looking towards trigeminal neuralgia. Okay, so we move to cranial nerve nine. So you can see we use nine to make the face. So nine, again, you will have your tongue and all of that in the mouth. So, close, so this is our glossopharyngeal nerve. Uh, it receives information from the throat, tonsils, middle ear, and back of the throat. It's involved with sensation of test for the back of the throat. So remember that cranial nerve nine relates to test for the back of the throat. So that's your glossopharyngeal. Glosso meaning 
your mouth, your tongue, and all of that. Uh, we go to cranial nerve 10, which we said we had this uh, sternal notch on our neck. So I, you can use that to remember your cranial nerve 10, and that's our vagus nerve. So the vagus nerve, uh, it helps with uh, the parasympathetic function that regulates heart rhythm. It also innervates the smooth muscles in your airways. It innervates the smooth muscles in the lungs and also in the gastrointestinal tract. It's actually the longest cranial nerve as it starts in the medulla and extends to the abdomen. Okay, so that's our cranial nerve 10. You can see 11 here, where we used it for the shoulder. So 11 here is what we use as shoulder, and that's our accessory nerve. It provides motor function to muscles in the neck. So you can always remember that where you have it positioned on the shoulder, on the neck, that's your accessory nerve. And the last but not the least would be our cranial nerve 12, which is located somewhere around here which is your hypoglossal nerve, and it deals with tongue muscles. So hypoglossal, so that's another glossal again. So that's your cranial nerve 12, and that's your hypoglossal muscle. So again, I would like you to go back and practice drawing your cranial nerves, so that way you get used to each and every one of them. And I'm hoping you are better artists and you can draw it this way. So basically, this is what it should look like. So again, remember we said number one is our olfactory nerve. Number two is our optic nerve. Number three is the oculomotor nerve that helps to deal with uh, the muscles around the eyes. Your four would be your trochlear nerve, which helps to look down uh, the muscles that look down in the eyes. And we said number five is our trigeminal nerve. And we always want to remember, you can see how, how much part of the face it elevates. And that's where your uh, trigeminal neuralgia comes from, because you can see how much neural, how much uh, of the trigeminal nerve runs around the face. So what happens is that uh, in trigeminal neuralgia, there's this stabbing or burning facial pain. It's actually very painful, very, very painful. Even small movements, such as even chewing or brushing your mouth can even trigger an attack. So again, that's your trigeminal nerve that's causing that. That's a disorder of the trigeminal nerve. Number six would be your abductions muscles that helps to look to the side. Seven would be your facial muscles. We said when you remember seven, you are thinking Bell's palsy. Uh, again, we looked at number eight, which is our acoustic nerve. We talked about acoustic neuroma. Number nine is your glossopharyngeal. We said one major point you need to notice it innervates the back of the tongue. Uh, number 10 is your vagus nerve, which we said regulates the heart rate and innervates the intestines and uh, our abdominal uh, airways, lungs, and gastrointestinal tract. Again, we said 11, which is our accessory or your spinal accessory nerve, which deals with muscles of the neck. And then 12, which is your hypoglossal, which deals with uh, innervating the tongue muscles. So let's look at trigeminal neuralgia. So this is a cranial nerve disorder where you have chronic pain that affects the trigeminal nerve. So you can see our trigeminal nerve and you can see how it innervates. So it innervates the ophthalmic zone, it innervates the maxillary zone, it innervates the uh, mandibular zone. So remember, it's the trigeminal nerve that carries sensations from the face to the brain. So if one has trigeminal neuralgia, even mild stimulation of the face from brushing your teeth or even putting on makeup may trigger a jolt of excruciating pain. So every morning when you wake up to apply makeup on your face and you are not feeling any pain, say, ah, thank God, I don't have trigeminal neuralgia. That way you will never forget it. Whenever you are drawing those eyelashes that face upwards and you're not feeling pain, Remember, thank God I don't have trigeminal neuralgia, which is uh, a condition that affects my trigeminal nerve, which is our fifth cranial nerve. So uh, we said it affects the fifth cranial nerve. 
and it could be caused by infections of the sinuses, even teeth infection or tooth infection, mouth infection, or irritation of the nerve from pressure. All of this could cause it. When you assess a patient, what you will find is stabbing or burning facial pain, excruciating pain, unpredictable pain, paroxysmal twitching, like moving the face up and down and twitching the face, grimacing of facial muscles. The patient is in pain. So that's one giveaway about a patient that's having trigeminal neuralgia. Part of your nursing consideration is to identify the stimuli that causes these attacks and you want to keep the client to avoid it. You want to administer medications like your carbamazepine and your analgesics. Okay, so your treatments include the carbamazepine. Uh, you could also inject alcohol to the nerve to deaden it, or we can resect the nerve where the nerve is cut to kill off those innervations. Uh, we can also advise the client to avoid rubbing the eyes, which can also precipitate it. And again, if he's having pain on one side of the face, you can tell him to chew on the other side of the face to avoid triggering an attack. We talked about Bell's palsy. What you will see in Bell's palsy is a sudden weakness in the muscles of one half of the face. So don't confuse this with a stroke. So this is sudden actually. Sudden weakness in the muscles on one half of the face. And it may actually be a reaction to a viral infection. Although it rarely occurs more than once. So like we said, it's characterized by muscle weakness that causes one half of the face to droop. Uh, remember we said we have our cranial nerve seven, which is our facial nerve. So that's what is impl uh, implicated in Bell's in, implicated in Bell's palsy. Okay, so uh, predisposing factors again would be vascular vascular ischemia, uh, viral diseases inflammatory reactions. And again, like we said, if you look at this client, what you will notice is he has this inability to close eye. So he will, he will be able to close his eye that doesn't have um, any uh, weakness, but then the one that has the weakness, uh, he will not be able to close it. So you can see this side of the face is what drooping. So he will be unable to close this eye. So inability to close eyes, there's a decreased corneal reflex. Remember that corneal reflex, every time your eye blinks, it kinds of, uh, the, the fluid from, it spreads the fluid around your eye to keep it moist and wet. But if the eye is constantly open, uh, this client could suffer a corneal or drying of the cornea. So there's this decreased corneal reflex. Uh, there's increased lacrimation, there's speech difficulty, loss of taste, and there's this asymmetrical facial muscle tone or sagging face or distortion of one side of the face. Part of your nursing consideration for this client would be, you want to protect the head from cold. Administer pain medications. We might need to use electric stimulations like your TENS, your TENS, we'll still talk about that. Uh, you want to teach isometric exercises for facial muscles. Like you can give him a straw and ask him to blow and suck from the straw. So blow, suck, blow, straw, uh, suck. You are trying to carry out isometric exercises of the facial muscles. You can also massage the face. You can carry out warm packs, use warm packs also to uh, massage the face. Again, the client will be feeling uh, down because of the altered body image. So you want to provide emotional support. Again, you want to provide artificial eardrops to prevent cornea abrasions because of the inability to close the eyes. Again, we said treatment would involve electrical stimulations, pain relievers, steroid therapies. And if it's as a result of a viral infection, we want to start him on antiviral medication. Again, recovery may take between three to five weeks.
Now let's look at acoustic neuroma. We already talked about this, where you have a neuroma pressing on the cochlear nerve. So you can see that mass pressing on that, on the cochlear nerve. So acoustic neuroma is also called vestibular schwannoma. It's a benign tumor. So that's your tumor over there that develops on the balance and hearing or auditory nerves that leads from the inner ear to the brain. So that's your benign tumor on the auditory nerve. So that's what your acoustic neuroma is. So the pressure on the nerve may cause hearing loss. It may also cause imbalance. So remember our acoustic nerve, which we use eight to signify is our eight cranial nerve. So you will notice deafness. It could be partial initially, and then it could get worse. Again, you will also notice imbalance or dizziness in this client. Your primary nursing intervention or consideration would be to treat this condition that may involve surgical excision of the tumor. Okay, so we may need to open up the patient. So you can see uh, this patient has been opened up. So normally they will have this clamp to stabilize the head and then they will cut in behind the ear to expose the trigeminal nerve. Uh, so that's your trigeminal nerve and that's our uh, blood vessel. So they're gonna open up to take out the uh, tumor that is pressing on the acoustic nerve. So what are your preoperative uh, and postoperative consideration? So this procedure is actually called a posterior fossa craniotomy because they're going to open through the scalp, through the skull, and uh, further down. So that's your posterior fossa craniotomy. So you want to assist with turning of the head and neck post procedure. Let's look at Gillian Barr's syndrome. So you can see what your normal nerve looks like, and you can see what a client's nerve with Gillian Barr syndrome looks like. You can see there's damaged myelin and the nerve fiber is exposed. So this is a condition in which the immune system attacks the nerve. Uh, it may be triggered by an acute bacteria or viral infection. It may follow immunizations also. So usually the symptoms start as weakness and tingling in the feet and the leg and it later spreads to the upper body and subsequently paralysis can occur. So that's also a point to note that the symptoms can start as weakness um, and tingling in the feet and the legs which later spreads to the upper body and subsequently paralysis can occur. So what would you see in this patient? There'll be paresthesia. That's that abnormal sensation of the skin where you start having tingling, prickling, chilling or burning or numbing sensation with no apparent physical cause. So that's your paresthesia. So you also see that. Again, this client will be complaining of pain that often occurs in glove and stocking distribution. So what's your glove and stocking distribution? So imagine somebody putting on an elbow length glove. Imagine someone putting, off, putting on a stockings that reaches the, uh, the knee. So that's where the patient will have that pain. That all those areas that the gloves covers and all those areas that the stockings covers, that's why it's referred to as a glove and stocking distribution. So the pain is present in areas that would be covered by the gloves or if or stockings, if he was hearing, wearing one. Okay, so motor losses is usually symmetrical. So it is progressive and it's symmetrical, usually beginning in the lower extremities and extends upwards to include the trunk, the upper extremities, the cranial nerves. It affects vasomotor function. Your deep tendon reflexes begin to disappear and there could be respiratory muscle compromise. So always remember, you want to secure your patient's airway 
in guillain barre syndrome because the, uh, the progress of the paralysis comes from down. And as it's coming up, there's a very high risk of this patient going into having a respiratory compromise. Again, there could be excessive or inadequate autonomic dysfunction where you will have hypotension, very fast heart rates, vasomotor flushing. What do we mean by vasomotor flushing? Uh, vasomotor symptoms include hot flashes and flushes, that sudden wave-like sensation of intense heat that usually starts about the neck and spreads over the body and the face causing a flush, which is now followed by perspiration. And then the body cools down and there's a chill. So night sweats are hot flushes that occur during the night and are accompanied by drenching sweats. So we could also have paralytic ileus, which is the occurrence of intestinal blockage in the absence of an actual physical obstruction. So this type of blockage is caused by malformation in the nerves and muscles of the intestine that impairs digestive movement. So usually you could have this disease progress uh, in the plateau period or the recovery period. The plateau period is where it progresses to peak severity between two to four weeks, while the recovery period would be between several months and there's reduced or residual disability. So part of our plan for this patient would include steroids again in the acute phase. We will need to carry out, because at this point, our interventions are more of symptomatic. It's more of symptomatic. So it's more of symptomatic. Uh, we can carry out special blood treatments. We can carry out special blood treatments like your uh, plasma exchange or plasma pheresis or IV immunoglobulin therapy. So this would help to relieve symptoms. Again, physiotherapy would also help. Um, we could give medications like your adrenocorticotrophic hormones or the corticosteroids. Again, this client might actually be, remember we talked about the respiratory compromise, the possible respiratory compromise. So he might actually have to be put on a mechanical ventilator. And again, you elevate the head of the bed. You also want to suction your clients as need be. Um, you also want to prevent hazards of immobility because your client is lying down for a very long period you need to look out for all those uh, issues that can arise with immobility. Uh, maintain adequate nutrition and hydration. You also want to carry out range of motion exercises, pain reducing measures, eye care, and also we need to prevent complications like our upper respiratory infections, aspirations, constipation, urinary retention. And again, you want to provide psychosocial support to deal with the fear, the anxiety, and the altered body image. Let's look at meningitis. Like we've said earlier, is an inflammation of the meninges. So these are the membranes that cover the brain and the spinal cord. And meningitis occur when fluids surrounding the meninges become infected. And the most common causes are viral and bacterial infections. Other causes would include neurosurgical procedures, bacillus skull fractures or fractures of the base of the skull, otitis media, and mastoiditis. So all of this can cause meningitis. And what do you see in your patient? It's going to present with headache. Is an infection is going to present with fever, a fever. There's going to be this light sensitivity or intolerance to light, which we refer to as photophobia. Again, you're going to see signs of meningeal irritation. So this is another good and clear question. What are the signs of meningeal infection? What are you, what do you see in a client with meningitis? You're going to see neck stiffness, 
which we refer to as nuchal, nuchal rigidity. So that's your neck stiffness. So nuclear will be neck, rigidity will be that stiffness. So this is your neck stiffness. Again, you will see the Koenig sign. So what happens with Koenig sign? When the hip is flexed to 90 degrees. So the hip is initially flexed to 90 degrees. When you try to completely extend the knee, there will be this uh, restriction. You, you will find it difficult to extend the client's knee and it's going to be really painful. That tells you this client has meningitis. So that's your Koenig's sign. You would also see Brudzinski sign, Brudzinski sign. So that would be an attempt to flex the neck. When you try to flex the client's neck, you'll have him lie still, and then you try to flex the neck. It would actually produce flexions at the knee and at the thigh. So this is your Brudzinski sign. That also tells you this client has meningitis. Again, you will see opistotonic position. So you can see this akin. This akin is a state of severe hyperextension and spasticity or stiffness in which an individual's head, neck, and spinal column enter into a complete akin position. So this is another good sign of meningitis. Again, you also see changes in LOC or your level of consciousness. There will be seizures. In infants, what would you see? They don't want to feed. There'll be vomiting. They will have diarrhea. Again, you will notice the front tunnels are bulging. Um, you will have this vacant stare. You look at them and they look like they are lost. That tells you this client might have meningitis. And when they want to cry, there's this very high pitched cry. So that's also another giveaway. So what do we want to do for this client who is infected or who is having this meningitis? We want to start him on IV antibiotic therapy like your penicillin, your cephalosporins, your vancomycin. We want to uh, monitor his arterial blood gas, monitor arterial pressures, uh, body weights, serum electrolytes, urine volume, specific gravity, osmolality. Again, you want to remember that with meningitis, you need to initiate droplet precautions. So initiate droplet precautions, which are used to prevent the spread of pathogens that are passed through respiratory secretions and do not survive for long in transit. You know, these droplets are relatively large particles that, that cannot travel to the air very far and they can be transmitted by coughing, sneezing, and talking. So you want to initiate droplet precautions for hemophilus influenza type B and Neisseria meningitidis. Let's look at Huntington's disease. So we have our normal brain here, and you can see there's an enlargement of the frontal horns of the lateral ventricles. So this is your Huntington's disease. It's actually an inherited disease. It progressively degenerates. It keeps getting worse. And what you see is that the nerve cells in the brain continue to break down over time. Normally, you will see this in clients. It usually starts in clients at, above, at around their 30s or 40 years of age. So it results in progressive movement symptoms. You would also see thinking or cognitive symptoms. You would also notice psychiatric symptoms. So in terms of assessments, there could be depression and temper outbursts. Uh, you will notice this choreiform movements. Chorea is a movement disorder that causes involuntary, irregular, unpredictable muscle movement. So you notice this uh, unpredictable movement, like uh, the slight to severe restlessness, there's facial grimacing, there's arm movements, irregular leg movement, there's twisting, turning, struggling, tongue movement. So those are your choreiform movements. They are irregular, they are unpredictable, they are involuntary. So in case you, you, I'm sure you can look back and notice someone you know that does some irregular movements and you're wondering what's wrong with him. It could be his 
he possibly has Huntington's disease. Okay, so um, part of the personality changes we said you will see would include, he will be highly irritable. There will be this paranoia where he's suspecting everybody around him. The client will be demanding. There will be memory loss. There will be decreased intellectual function. There could be dementia. And at the end stage, you will start noticing psychosis. So that's psychosis is what is a condition that affects the way your brain, your brain processes information. So it causes the person to lose touch with reality. So the person starts to see, hear, or believe things that are not real. So that's psychosis. So you usually see that during the end stage. As part of your plan and implementation, no cure exists, but drugs, physiotherapy, and talk therapy can help manage some symptoms. Some of the drugs that are intended to reduce this movement and subdue these behavioral changes would include your chlorodiazepoxide hydrochloride. So you always see this in your NCLEX uh, test. So this would be your Librium. Librium is a sedative, it's a hypnotic medication, and it's used to treat anxieties, insomnia, symptoms of withdrawal from alcohol and other drugs. Again, we could also use haloperidol. So you will see it named or listed as haldol on the NCLEX. It's a typical antipsychotic medication. It's used in the treatment of schizophrenia, uh, mania in bipolar disorder, acute psychosis and all of that. There's also your clopromazine. It's a phenothiazine that is used to also treat psychotic disorder. Clopromazine is also used in adults to treat nausea and vomiting and many other conditions. So you also want to offer supportive and treat symptoms as they arrive. Again, remember we said it's an inherited disease. So you want to carry out genetic counseling for all family members. We all know migraine headaches. Migraine headaches is a result of specific changes within the brain. It causes the head, it causes severe head pain that is often accompanied with sensitivity to light or photophobia, sensitivity to sound, or even smells. And one of the most common symptoms include eye pain. You can see the redness in the eye. So that patient is having one-sided headaches and all of that. So it's usually an episodic event or acute attack. It just comes and is seen mostly in women before their are menses. It's a familial disorder due to inherited vascular response to different chemical. So it's also, it also could be inherited and precipitating factors include stress. Stress can precipitate a migraine headache, menstrual cycles, bright lights. The patient being in a very bright light can trigger a migraine headache. Even depression, sleep deprivation, fatigue, foods containing tyramine could also trigger this. Foods containing tyramine, nitrates or milk products, all this could trigger um, a a migraine headache. So in terms of our plan for this patient, we want to carry out or give medications like our beta blockers. Um, we want to give acetaminophen, your NSAIDs. We also want to give topiramate, which you could see as Topamax in your NCLEX. It's used to treat epilepsy and prevent migraine. We also want to give egotamines, so usually they need to take it at the beginning of the headache. Uh, it works by narrowing the blood vessels around the brain. It also affects blood patterns or blood flow patterns that are associated with certain types of headache. So you also want to give egotamines or egots or cafegots as it's known here. Again, you want to modify trigger factors, eliminate factors that can trigger this client having an attack. You also want to initiate comfort measures, nurse the patient in a quiet, dark environment, also elevate the head of the bed to 30 degrees. 
We can also give riboflavin, which is a supplement. Uh, it may reduce the number and duration of the migraines, but it will not uh, reduce the severity of the headaches. We could also carry out massage, medications, and relaxation techniques. So we have actually come to the uh, end of the first part of the course, which dealt with more of the ear. So let's go into eye disorders, and we can start with visual function tests. Uh, so when assessing a patient with a sensory and perceptual alterations, what would you see in this patient? There will be redness, there will be burning, uh, there will be pain in the eyes, there will be swelling, increased lacrimation and exudate or discharge. You would notice headaches, squinting, there will be nausea and vomiting, there will be altered growth and development, and then there will be altered visual function tests. So what are the visual function tests we can carry out? We can carry out tonometry. So this would be your tonometry. So you can see the optician or whoever is carrying out the test is using a pen-like uh, equipment to measure the intraocular pressure within the eye. So they are going to press this against the eye and this equipment will measure the intraocular pressure within the eye. So this pressure, this measurement can help to determine if a client is at risk or not for glaucoma. So when you want to carry out this procedure, the client has to be recumbent, place him in a recumbent position. If he has contact lenses, you want to remove the contact lens. You want to advise the client not to squint or cough or hold his breath during the procedure because all of this can increase the intraocular pressure. Again, before we carry out this procedure, the cornea will be anesthetized and then the tonometer will be applied to measure the degree of indentation of the cornea when pressure is applied. So if the pressure is increased, it tells you this client could be a good candidate for glaucoma. Another visual function test would be your Snelling test. So these are our Snelling tests here. So it tests visual acuity. So remember, tonometry test in, uh, measures intraocular pressure, while Snelling test tests visual acuity. So for this one, you ask the client to stand 20 feet from the chart. So you can see our chart with so many letters and you cover one eye at a time and the client reads the chart from uh, the top to the smallest visible letters. So the test results indicate the comparison of this same distance, which a normal eye would see at 20 feet from this. So that's where if the client stops on this level, he can see the next line. You can say it's 20 over 40. If he's able to read this, that will be 20 over 30. So this is where the normal eye should be, which would be at 20 over 20. Another visual function test would be measuring the visual field, the area, the visual, the perimetry around which the eye can see. So this uh, visual feed measurement is measuring your range of vision or perimetry. So the client is seated at a distance from the chart of concentric circles. And the client is asked to fix eye on a point on a chart. So the client will be seated here and he will be asked to look inside this machine and fix his eyes at a certain point. And then the client is instructed to in indicate when he sees a pointer. So what the test, the person carrying out the test will do is to keep moving the pointer to different visual fields. And the client needs to indicate where he see the pointer or if he's able to see the pointer. For example, this client is having homonymous hemanopsia. So you can see he's not seen on these sides of both eyes. So when the pointer comes to this area, he would indicate that he cannot see it. So that's what this client, this uh, visual field test does. It measures to see how much around the visual field for each eye. 
So the normal visual fields are approximately 50 degrees angle superiorly, 90 degrees laterally, 70 degrees inferiorly, and 60 degrees medially. To look at our disorders of accommodation. So here we have myopia. So you can see in myopia what happens, the light ray refracts at a point in front of the retina. So for this, we need to recommend corrective lenses for this client. We also have hyperopia, which is also farsightedness. So this is short-sightedness or near-sightedness. This is farsightedness. And here the light rays refract behind the retina. So this client would also benefit from corrective lenses. We also have presbyopia, which is an, a gradual age-related loss of the eye's ability to focus actively on nearby objects. So once you see press biopia, remember it comes with aging. So the client would also benefit from corrective lenses. And then we have astigmatism. So what happens here is that there's uneven curvature of the cornea causing blurring of vision. So that would be your astigmatism. So you can see the, the light rays are refracting in multiple points. So the visual, the, the visual field will not be clear as it should. So that will be your astigmatism. What happens when you have endless questions related to bones of the eyes? We need to know that we have different types of bones that could affect the eyes. It could be as a result of acid cleaners or insecticides, which we would categorize as chemical bones. What do you need to do? You want to copiously irrigate the eyes with water for 15 to 20 minutes. In terms of the sunburn to the eye or lightning or eclipse, which will fall under radiation category, you need to prevent this. If there's an eclipse, you don't want to look directly into the sun. You want to use eye shields. In terms of thermal burns, like from hot metals, liquids, other occupational hazards, make sure you use your eye goggle to protect the eyes when you are working in a hazardous environment. Again, you might need to patch the eye if it's affected by any of the thermal uh, effects. And again, you want to give analgesics to relieve the pain. In terms of eye trauma, we could have a non-penetrating trauma to the eye, which could be an abrasion. Here, the area is just damaged by scraping or wearing off. So that's just an abrasion. For this, the client will need to wear an eye patch for 24 hours. It could be a contusion, which is also non-penetrating. In contusion is actually a medical term for a bruise, a superficial bruise. So for this, you might need to apply a cold compress. Uh, you might need to give analgesics and pain relievers. Again, it could be a penetrating kind of trauma, through, uh, usually through a pointed or a sharp object. Again, you don't want to remove whatever is puncturing the eyes. You want to cover the eye with a patch and refer the client to a surgeon. So let's look at eye infections and inflammations. So this would, if we start with conjunctivitis, so this would be our viral conjunctivitis. This would be our bacterial conjunctivitis. So this is commonly known as pink eye usually caused by bacterial, virus, or allergies, uh, or swelling in the outer membranes of the eyeballs. So why, why is it this red? Blood vessels in the conjunctiva, which is a thin membrane that lines part of the eyes, has become inflamed. And that's why it's all red. So this gives the eye the red or pink color that's commonly associated with conjunctivitis. What do you want to do for this patient? You could apply warm, moist compresses, we can put in topical antibiotics. We could also use hydrocortisone ophthalmic ointments. So what would this be? This would be a sty. So this is our sty, S-T-Y-E. So this is a sty, which is a red, painful lump near the edge of the eyelid. It may actually look like a boil or a pimple. You can see this almost, this is a pimple or a boil. It's looking like a boil and it can, develop after the small glands that line the eyelid get plugged. 
So there's that obstruction or that occlusion of the small glands that line the eyelid. Our styles are often filled with pulse. Sometimes a style can form on the inner part of the eyelid on the other side. It could be caused by a staphylococcal organism. Again, you want to carry out warm compress, start this client on antibiotics. At some point, you might need to carry out incision and also drain this. So this would be a chalazion. So this would be a chalazion. It's a small, slow growing lump or cyst that develops within the eyelid. It's a small, slow growing lump or cyst that develops within the eyelid. They are not usually painful and they rarely last longer than a few weeks. So it develops when a mebioman gland at the edge of an eyelid becomes blocked or inflamed. So these glands produce the oil that lubricates the surface of the eye. And then when this obstructed, what you will have is a chalazion. So again, we might need to carry out incision and drainage for this client. So this would be keratitis, which is the next. So this would be keratitis, which is a condition in which the eye's cornea, which is a clear dome on the front surface of the eye, becomes inflamed. So it's actually marked by moderate to intense pain and usually involves impaired eyesight, photophobia or light sensitivity, red eye, and a gritty sensation. So that's your keratitis, inflammation of the cornea. It could be caused by a virus or a spread of systemic disease. So a disease from somewhere else can spread up into the eyes. Again, we want to start this client on antibiotics. We can put hot compresses and also use steroids. But you don't want to use steroids if the client has herpes simplex disease. And the last but not the least would be uveitis. So this would be a normal eyes, and this is this would be our uveitis or uveitis. It's a form of eye inflammation. It affects the middle layer of tissue in the eye, which is the uvea. So the uvea is the middle layer of eye tissue in the walls of the eye. So warning signs often come on suddenly and they get worse quickly. So you will see eye redness, pain, and blood vision. So uveitis again is the inflammation of the iris, the ciliary body, and the choroid. So you might want to give this patient dark glasses to wear, start him on antibiotics, pain relievers, sedatives. And again, you can carry out uh, warm compresses to help this client. Let's look at care of the blind client. Care of the blind client. Remember, we talked about how to enhance communication with a client who is deaf. So now we are looking at how to enhance communication in a client who is blind. So when you want to address a client who is blind, you want to address the client by name. So that way he knows you are talking to him. Again, you also want to introduce yourself so that he also knows who is talking to him. Hello, ma. I'm not Jumoke, so he knows it's not Jumoke that's talking to him. Again, state reason for being there so that he doesn't just feel you are standing and staring at him. You want to let him or her know why you are there. Again, if you are leaving the room, inform the client because he cannot see you leave so that it doesn't look like you sneaked out. So always tell the client you are about to leave the room. Again, you also want to provide a sense of safety and security by explaining all procedures in details. Remember, he cannot see, so he needs to get as much information as you can give him. Again, keep the furniture arranged in a consistent manner so that he knows the chair is always to his left. You don't want to keep moving the furniture around, and then he can want to sit thinking the chair is still in that position, whereas it's not. Provide handrails. The door should never be left half, half open so that the client doesn't walk into the door and hit himself and injures himself. Again, have clients follow attendants when walking by lightly touching attendant's elbow. 
So the client should be the one holding you, not you holding the client. Again, instruct the client in use of lightweight walking stick when walking alone. You also want to foster a sense of independence. Don't do everything for the client and then he's dependent on you. Provide assistance only when needed. Identify food and location on plates or tray and encourage recreational and leisure activities. For the client who might, have, who might have lost an eye, you need to teach him about how to take care of his artificial eyes. He needs to know that he needs to remove them daily for cleansing, and he can clean them with mild detergent and water. So you can see the eyes being cleaned under running water. Again, you want to dry and store in water soaking solution or contact lens soaking solution. So it has to be stored inside a solution, either water or contactless solution. Again, if it's going for surgery, you want to remove the artificial eyes before it goes into surgery. In terms of inserting the eyes, you want to raise the upper lid and then slip the eye beneath it and leave the lid. And then you support the lower lid and then draw it over the lower edge of the artificial eyes. So that's how you want to insert uh, the artificial eyes. In terms of removal, you go the other way around, draw the lower lid downwards, slip the eye forward over the lower lid and remove. And then you can, if it's under prescription, you can instill eye drops. We talked about glaucoma where we said the tonometer was going to help us to determine if a client has glaucoma, where we said we are measuring the intraocular pressure of the eye. So glaucoma is actually an abnormal increase in intraocular pressure of the eye. So this will lead to uh, visual, disturb uh, visual disturbances or disabilities and also blindness. And one major findings you see is the obstruction of outflow of aqueous humor. So when you assess your client, what do you see? The complaints of blood vision or loss of vision or cloudy vision. Artificial lights, if it looks at a light bulb, it looks as if there's rainbows around it or halos around them. There's decreased peripheral vision. If it's looking straight forward, it, it's, vision is limited to the side. So that's what we refer to as peripheral vision. There's pain, there's headache. You could also have nausea and vomiting. So we have the angle closure glaucoma and the open angle glaucoma. In angle closure glaucoma, what do you see? A sudden onset, angle closure, a sudden onset is an emergency and it's associated with emotional disturbances, allergy, and also vasomotor disturbances. In terms of open angle or primary glaucoma, there's blockage of aqueous humor flow uh, it's associated with trauma, tumor, hemorrhage, and also aging. And your major nursing diagnosis for this client will be disturbed sensory perception. In terms of planning for a client who has glaucoma, we need to start him on medications like your prostaglandin agonists, your beta adrenergic blockers, your cholinergic agonists, your carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. The client might need to go for surgery and we'll need to carry out laser trabeculoplasty. So here, an argon laser is used to improve drainage through the eye's trabecular meshwork from which aqueous humors drain. So if you look back at our picture, you will see that trabecular meshwork. Normally, your aqueous humor flows this way and is reabsorbed. But what happens in glaucoma, the trabecular meshwork is blocked and there's accumulation of the uh, fluid in the eyes and that builds up to increase the intraocular pressure. So we're going to carry out laser tra uh, trabeculoplasty to open up and improve the drainage. Again, you want the client to avoid tight clotting, like tight collars on the neck. He also needs to avoid or reduce external stimuli, avoid heavy lifting and straining. Anything that would increase the intraocular pressure, it should be avoided. 
Another important thing you need to note for the NCLEX is that the client has to avoid use of myadratics. So these are medicines that can make the pupil of the eye to dilate or open up. So that would further complicate his condition. For example, your atropine. So you need to avoid use of myadratics. Again, you want to educate him to danger signs of glaucoma, like the blood vision, the halos around the lights, blurry vision, diminished peripheral vision, headaches, and eye pain. So you want to educate the public to danger signs of glaucoma, which are some of what is listed on the slide. So now we move at, we look at cataracts. So cataracts will be partial or total opacity of the normally transparent lens. Normally the lens should be transparent, but what do you have here? The lens has become opaque, meaning it loses that uh, ability for light rays to pass. So that's what happens in cataracts. The lens become clouded by cataracts. So what causes it? It could be congenital cataract, it could be caused by trauma or the aging process. It's also associated with diabetes, intraocular surgery, even drugs like steroid therapy, and even exposure to radioactivity. So what you see is that the client will complain that objects appear distorted and blurred. There is decreased color perception with cataracts. If you look at them, if you look at this eye, you feel like he's just staring at you or that annoying glare. So that's what you see. The client also complains of diplopia, which would be your double vision. And the pupils will change from black to gray and to milky white. So what's your plan for this client? We can carry out surgical extraction. It could be extracapsular extraction where we cut through the anterior capsule to expose the opaque lens or intracapsular extraction where we carry out entire removal of the lens and the capsule and then implant an artificial lens. After the surgery, you want to observe for post-operative complications. What post-operative complications are you looking at for after surgery for cataract? Hemorrhage or bleeding is one complication that could result. How do you know this patient is bleeding into the eyes? There will be sudden sharp pain. So you look out for that in the NCLEX. Your patient has, has undergone surgery and it complains of sudden, sudden sharp pain. That will tell you he could be bleeding into the eyes. Again, you're looking out for increased intraocular pressure. Remember, our normal intraocular pressure should be between 10 to 20 millimeters of mercury. So you want to look out for increased intraocular pressure. Again, you're looking out for infection. You could see infection, it could be yellow or greenish uh, drainage. That will tell you there's an infection. You could also see slipped sutures where the wound will break open or the suture line will break open. Again, if the lens is implanted, you want the pupils to remain constricted. But if there's no lens, if the lens has been totally removed, the pupils need to remain dilated. Again, post-procedure, avoid straining, avoid heavy lifting. Don't bend from the knees to pick up things. This is also another good and close question. You want to avoid bending from the knees to pick things up. Sorry, you want to bend from the knees to pick things up rather than bending uh, at your waist. You want to bend from the knees to pick things up. Again, you want to instruct in installation of eye drops to the affected eyes. So you want, like we discussed, uh, talked about eye drop installation, you want to teach the client on the proper position. Remember we said for the adults, the U tells up backwards and upwards, while for the child, the D tells us backwards and downwards. Uh, if you are instilling airdrops. But for the eyes, you want to instill from the inner canthus and allow it flow down the eyes. Again, you want to advise the client to use night shields. Uh, suggest to sleep on the unaffected side. So this will help to decrease pain and swelling. 
when their the affected side is elevated, protect the eye from bright, bright lights and water, uh, reports the increased pain or change in vision or increased floaters. So you want to in, uh, report this to the healthcare provider. So remember on the NCLEX, what you will see most is the healthcare provider, not the doctor or the physician. So let's look at retinal detachment. So this should be your normal retina. And here you can see the retina is detached. So there's separation of the retina from the choroid. This could be caused by trauma to the eye or the aging process or diabetes or even tumor. So what do you see in a client with detached retina? There's flashes of light. He has this sooty vision or blood vision. He keeps complaining of floaters, things floating and moving up and down in his eyes. So there's that sensation of particles moving in line of vision. Uh, there's a delineated areas of vision that are blank. Some part of his eyes is just blank. He doesn't see uh, through that part of the eyes. So there's loss of vision, there's confusion and apprehension. So you want to uh, place your client on bed rest. Uh, the affected eyes or both eyes may be patched to decrease movement of the eye. Most times, they might want to patch both eyes, even though one is affected, because the two eyes move together. And if you patch only the affected eyes and this other one, the good eye is moving around, looking up and down, the one that is patched that's supposed to be resting would also be moving around because it's made to move, uh, the both of them are designed to move together. So that's why you need to patch both eyes. You can also see that in, in uh, trauma cases, penetrative wounds to the eye. Most times they won't just patch only one eye, even though it's only one eye that has the object. They would advise that you patch both of them so that as the other eye is not moving, the affected eye would also not be moving. Again, you want to carry out specific positioning. So the area of detachment, the eye that is affected should be in the dependent position. So take, procedure, uh, take precautions to avoid bumping the head moving the eyes rapidly or jerking the head rapidly. So you want to avoid all that or take precautions to avoid them. Again, we might need to carry out surgery to reattach the retina to the choroid. Here, we use gas or air bubble to apply pressure to the retina. Again, you want to advise the clients no hair washing for one week. We can administer our sedatives and the tranquilizers and the clients should avoid strenuous activities for three months. For a client undergoing eye surgery. Okay, I think we already dealt with this. Okay, we already talked about a client undergoing eye surgery. So let's look at strabismus. So this would be, uh, this would be strabismus and you can see here, the eyes do not function as a unit. So there's an imbalance of the extraocular muscle. So part of what you will see is visible deviation of eye. So this is looking inwards and this is looking straight. So this would be your esotropia because eso in. So this would be extrotopia. So you have almost this one still looking straight and this one looking outward. So this would be extrotopia. So you will see the visible deviation of the eye there will be double vision or diplopia. And if it's a child, he will tilt his head or he will have to squint to focus and see what he wants to look at very well. Part of your plan would be non-surgical intervention. And this must begin not later than six years of age. So if you want to correct this, we want to start not later than six years of age in a child. Again, we want to occlude the unaffected eye. So this eye now is unaffected. So we want to close this. Remember we said this muscle weakness that is causing this eye to not function together with this as a unit. So by closing this, will help this eye to increase in strength. So occlusion of unaffected eye to strengthen the weaker eye. We could also give corrective lenses correct, uh, combined with other therapy to improve visual acuity. We can also carry out Orthoptic exercises, which are designed to strengthen the eye muscles. Again, we might need to carry out surgery 
on the rectus muscles of the eye to correct this disorder. And the last slide for the day would be our retinopathy of prematurity. So this is a major cause of blindness in premature infants. So high oxygen concentration cause the premature infant's retinal vessels to constrict, and this would lead to blindness. So again, high oxygen concentration causes the infant's retinal vessels to constrict and lead to blindness. Sometimes it occurs when oxygen concentrations are greater than 40% in the infant's use, and when used for longer than 48 to 72 hours in infants. So part of what you will see is this demarcation line. So this demarcation line will form. So what happens now is that there's a separation from the vascularized retina posteriorly. So you can see all of our vessels, our retinal vessels, these are still intact. But these ones now have lost blood supply and they are beginning to die off. So what you will see is a demarcation between the uh, vascular retina anteriorly and the vascular retina posteriorly. And subsequently, a bridge would form. So this is our ridge that has formed to completely demarcate both sides of the uh, retina. And then finally, there will be retinal detachment, just like we discussed in the last slide. So what do you want to do for your client? You want to ensure that all infants born before 36 weeks or infants that are less than 2,000 grams at birth have an eye exam. So any infant born before 36 weeks or that is less than 2,000 grams, they must have their eye exam. Their eyes must be examined by an expert. Again, use minimal amount of oxygen. While this client is on oxygen, monitor his PO2 levels and maintain his SO2 levels within normal limits. We might need to administer vitamin E because this is thought to affect tissue response to oxygen. Although this therapy is controversial, but if it's ordered, we might need to administer vitamin E. And the last but not the least, we we'll need to decrease environmental stimuli and continuous direct lighting. And at this point, I, will need, I, will, uh, I want to say we've come to the end of the course. And um, I would like to thank everyone for participating. I don't I wouldn't want to keep us longer than necessary. Uh, so I would just like to end it and say thank you everyone for participating. And I would like to advise, uh, please for the tomorrow video course, please make sure uh, you do well to watch the video, do the day's activity for tomorrow. And we'll be glad to meet again on Saturday, I guess, for the last, uh, slides or the last presentations on, on uh, operative care. So thank you very much, everyone, and have a good night rest. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good night. Good night, everyone.